I'm Dave McLaren and you are watching the CLF Research YouTube channel. Today we're going to have a look at the new Gino Espada and where did this thing come from? You might have heard the story that okay, the Espada had something to do with a model that Leo Fender was working on a long time ago. Well, the truth is the, the model that he was working on was very much intended to be uh, kind of the next generation um, Fender Premium 2 pickup model. So let's take a look at where Espada started technically. We have uh, obviously a 2 pickup guitar. Uh, it's in a Telecaster shape, but that was just a matter of convenience uh, because Fender R&D would just send uh, bodies to Leo and he would work on them. In 1967-68, of course, CLF Research was uh, right nearby the Fender company because Leo Fender was still continuing to work under contract as a consultant to CBS Fender. CBS, who he had sold the Fender company to in 1965. He's no longer the boss anymore, but he's still uh, working for them. The first thing we notice about this is this guitar has split coil pickups. So these are naturally humbucking because, you know, one coil is reverse wind, reverse uh, polarity relative to the other one. This is uh, what Leo Fender would call a percussive humbucking pickup, as opposed to what he called an end-to-end -end humbucker. Like if we think about a Gibson humbucker, for example, a traditional PA off of virtually all guitar humbuckers. Those he would call end-to-end, -end, meaning because the trap goes from one end of the string out all the way to the other end. This, uh, these little split coil gauze, he called percussive because it was his way of describing the Fender sound, the single coil sound, you know? Uh, if you think of the Stratocaster, the Telecaster, you know, the brightness of that. He called that a percussive sound. So in this configuration, he called them a percussive humbucking pickup. So the goal was to eliminate 60 cycle hum, and that's what these did naturally. So in Leo Fender's world, where he was very much about problem solving for musicians. Uh, okay, this was a nice way to get rid of the single coil hum, and uh, we can check that off the list. You know, you can make it sound beautiful, you know, just adjusting you know, the same parameters you would with a conventional single coil. So to him, this was just the next way forward. Let's just tick that box, we're done with 60 cycle hum. The next feature on this one, which uh, I think would have been rather surprising, to, uh, to the CBS Fender managers is Leo intended to put an onboard buffer preamp on the instrument. Underneath here, this is like a very elongated Telecaster control plate. And the reason why it's elongated is not just to house the switch, is underneath here is a mounting for a little preamp buffer board. And on the back, it, underneath this plate is where the batteries are. And I say batteries because there's six AA batteries wired to achieve nine volts. In fact, let's take a look under the hood. My brother Johnny just found this plate, gosh, maybe six months ago or something like that. You know, this, this thing's been around here forever, but the plate was in a drawer and Johnny found it. Okay, let's take a look underneath the plate. Take ourselves back to the late 60s, 67, 68. Okay, so you can see it has the typical nine volt connector. Let's just unsnap, unsnap that. So you can see we have the six AA batteries and they mount in that cavity right there. <laughs> Wait, I think you can see it's really crudely routed because hey, when you're doing prototyping and you just need to make a hole, uh, back then you were just gonna manually knock that out and quickly get it done. Probably Ronnie Beers did that here. Ronnie was uh, a handyman they worked for Leo for many years and actually Ronnie built all the benches that you see around here, including these. I'll let my brother Johnny tell the story about Ronnie Beers. But I'll put this back together. Okay, why would 
was he looking at putting the onboard preamp there? He was doing well, they were selling plenty of guitars, and in fact, CBS's job, primary focus was just how do we make more of them? Not how do we make them more complex? Well, when Leo was looking at problem solving, he thought about, okay, well, 60 cycle hum, let's tick that off the box. But then when guitarists or bass players, you know, they plug in, okay, they're at the mercy of this chord, how long the chord is. So he's thinking, well, hey, you know, why don't we just contain that problem right there? We'll put a little buffer electric, you know, buffer preamp on here. And that way you're not worried about the chord loading up the, uh, the guitar, you know? You could use a 15 foot, 20 foot chord, who cares? You have that benefit, but also with the, uh, the onboard EQ, you could do a little equalization if you want, because once you're in there, it's not hard to add a bit to it. But the primary function was to be a robust buffer preamp. He was thinking very much still about uh, the working musician on the road, and uh, if, if he's gonna give them something with electronics in it, he was concerned that they may be uh, fearful of, hey, this is one more thing to break. Uh, they know what it's like when amplifiers break on the road and so forth. This is, oh geez, now my guitar has electronics in it. So he actually kept this word quite simple. So it was uh, the kind of thing that could be easily serviced on the road. But going back to the batteries, this is the neatest thing. I really love to speculate about this because if we think about the time when he was doing this, this is 1967 into 1968 when he's working on this. At that time, the transistor radios, as we called them in the States, were very popular and they used nine volt batteries. So the little rectangular nine volt batteries that we called transistor batteries because the association with the little transistor radios, pocket radios, Leo might've been concerned either about the cost of those being too much. But I think the greater thing would have been he was concerned about availability because he knows what it's like for musicians to be touring anywhere. You know, they, wherever they go, they could get double A batteries for sure. Those were everywhere in this country and just about the world. Nine volt batteries, those transistor batteries, yeah, they were fairly widely available, but you had to know going into every town that you could change the battery. So we think that Leo was looking at this uh, just as an assurance to prospective musicians that, hey, if you buy this next generation guitar that has electronics on board, rest assured the batteries are widely available and should you need to repair it, it's a very simple circuit board. Maybe you can't repair it on the fly, but it's not like a printed board, you know, where the surface mount, forget it, goodbye. This is pretty easy to solder up. So what are these controls doing? We just have volume and treble. There's no bass on it. Uh, and a reason for that is these pickups, they look like the electric 12. And in fact, I don't have an electric 12 here, but I do have this uh, R&D mule that was been around here in the CLF research land since the beginning. Uh, so the Electric 12, I believe, was really like the last complete instrument that Leo was working on. And never mind the 12 string part of that, the split coil percussive humbucking pickups. So 1965 when that's, that came out, that's where he was at. His mindset was at, ah, here's how I get my crystal clear Leo, you know, my Fender sound, but without the 60 cycle hum. This is just a wonderful way to go about that. And we've been doing it with the P bass, it's working nice in this guitar. Let's do more of that. So if you think that that's where he was in for a single coil percussive sound, it's natural that the very next thing he starts working on, if it's gonna be having a percussive single coil sound, uh, he'd be using these little split coil guys. Now in this case, these don't have many turns of wire on it. There's not much wire on them. They're actually quite weak pickups. But with the preamp on board preamp full time, these can have a nice, uh, very rich harmonic sound to them, but it's bolstered, it's beefed up by the preamp. So this, these pickups, they depend on this preamp to be there, but together they have a very nice 
clean, a studio-like kind of quality to them. So this is a three-way pickup selector, as you can imagine, standard stuff. But this guy, this takes these pickups and it puts them both on, out of phase with one another. And the, the thing, this is one of those super kind of like hyperspace switches where no matter where this is, you could be in the bridge pick position, neck position, middle pick position, doesn't matter. You hit this, boom, it's you're instantly into the super funk zone, which is this out of phase position. Now imagine it's 67, 68, look at what's happening and the music is changing. There was a lot of think, 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 very thin fendery sound kind of stuff. And this thing was really delivering that. Uh, what else can we talk about on this guy? We talked about these pickups and why these, these are the, uh, uh, what he called percussive humbucking pickups. Um, we talked about why he wanted to do an onboard preamp. Uh, first of all, it checks another problem. In other words, you plug in your cord, you don't have to worry about what's going on with your cord. Long cord, short cord, doesn't matter. You've taken care of that. You, you've taken control of that on the guitar, no longer at the mercy of the cord. Thirdly, you can do a bit of equalization while you're in there. The other thing that he was, so electronics were of course his his favorite part of, of guitars and basses always had been. You know, he started with his radio repair, so that was, it's not surprising that he would be looking forward to do things with more sophisticated electronics inside the instrument. Let's take a look at this bridge. People look at this and they think it's uh, some kind of, it's a vibrato? What, what, what is that thing? This is actually a uh, fixed bridge, hardtail bridge. And if you look at it, you see, okay, here's a screw goes in the wood. Uh, uh, here we have two studs, but they're kind of height adjustment ones. So this, the saddle heights are determined by the diameter of the saddle and the overall height uh, is uh, determined by these two studs. And these two studs are just screwed into wood. So at this point, this bridge is completely research and development exploratory. And the purpose was, is Leo was trying to find out how to get more sustain in the instrument. So of course, you know, you have, you know, there's this joint everybody looks at, but what, are, okay, what are the two points of contact of the string? Up here at the nut, and ride down here across the saddle. So we want to maximize the ability of the vibrations to travel through these. Now, in the body, or the wood, the Leo noted that the vibrations, they tend to want to travel more with the wood grain, with the wood grain, as opposed to against the grain, like across it. So if you say, uh, take a, say a Telecaster bridge, and that has a string through the body and people understand, hey, it's tugging through the body, all that tension, lean on that saddle, kind of compresses the body, if you will, a little bit, and that adds to sustain. But what Leo wanted to figure out is, how can I try to get as much of that energy of the string to press, not compressing the body from through the back, but how can I get that energy to press against end grain of wood? Because if it, the string, if the string energy travels better with the end grain, hey, what we wanna do is try to get as much of that energy, boom, into the end grain. So, take a look at these saddles closely. Here, I'm gonna see if I can get real close. Okay, you see the saddles here, the string crosses, then they go these, through these other saddle-like things. These guys are actually little levers that pivot against the, the leading edge of their holes. So if, I don't know if we can maybe turn it this way, we can see a little better. Maybe you can see there's a little slot right there. So if there's a slot in the saddle, that's what lets this piece, which goes all the way through the back, pivot. So if the string So when the string is pulling this way, it's pulling the top of this arm forward, pivoting against this plate, making the back of the uh, arm press this way against the end grain of the wood. 
So he's trying to take all the leverage of this string energy, that taut string energy, and turn it into compression against the end grain of the wood. But of course, this bridge, this at this time, it's research and development. Leo had a contract for five years as a consultant to CBS after he had sold them the company. So it's during that time, during the uh, early years of CLF research, that he was doing this work to offer for Fender. If we look at this guitar technically, this bridge does work. It could use a bit of refining, but at the time CBS wasn't interested in making more complicated instruments. CBS was more interested in making just more instruments. That's why they constructed the, the big factory that Leo was kind of skittish. He didn't do it, but CBS did. They built the big thing. So the whole goal was to, hey, we're gonna make more of the same stuff that's been working. And well, Leo is looking at this stuff and uh, with all this complexity, and then you have this bridge that has all these individual parts on it. And there's this part, these, while these levers are rectangular, at least in this example here, they fit into slots that also must be rectangular. Uh, the Fender manufacturing team at the time using pin routers would look, be probably looking at this and going, oh geez, I can make slots in here with my uh, pin router. And a pin router is essentially just a big drill bit. So whatever it cuts, if it cuts through it, it cuts, it's like a cil cylindrical, right? The end, you can imagine you'd end up with a half a circle at this end and half a circle at this end. And then what? Or do they have to have an elaborate punch to do this? Uh, but the manufacturing people be looking like this and going, oh geez, uh, I don't know if I wanna to try to make that. The other cool thing is while we've got this far technically, it felt like there's, to, my, to me anyway, there was a rush to try to get something done before the agreement expired something let's try to get or let's try to get one guitar done and approved that was the tough thing while cbs was playing playing along and they would chip in a little bit here for some tooling things but not it didn't feel like uh, to leo great support but like going as we say uh, in america or english going through the motions you're doing it but your heart's not in it leo's heart was very much in it and I think uh, he was kind of a bit disappointed that as the 60s drew to a close, it, it was very clear they were not interested in things like this that added this kind of complexity. So by 1969, some of this, these guts, if you will, of this, the technical development was fairly well done. And then there was the styling development that was done in late 1969. So the late 1969 uh, drawings, uh, what we did is we just chose our favorite one of the 1969 drawings. And we brought it to life by fly, as I say, it's like we picked up Leo's prototype and drawings and we flew it through the decades of his technical development and finally brought it to market 50 years later in 2019. So this styling was done in 1969. So where this had these lightly wound single coil sound percussive humbucking pickups, so do these. You could say they're sort of like our Comanche pickups, yes and no. The yes part, the Comanche also has two MFD coils, but this one, these pickups are different on the Espada. These have a longer uh, or a wider aperture. They're deeper like these, less wired. They're designed to, to sing more, with artic more articulate, less aggressive. But unlike the Comanche, this guitar has an onboard buffer preamp. This guitar, the MFD pickups have enough power. That technology gives you enough power to have these guys play in either series or parallel. In the case of these small pickups, like you know, these lightly wound guys or, uh, or an electric 12 or you know, a P bass, they're always wired in series. That means these two little guys, these are, sep these are actually separate pickups just stuck next to each other. 
but one is, uh, as, is wound in the opposite direction, and the magnets have the opposite polarity relative to the other pickups. So that may th makes them naturally home canceling. So we've done the same here, but we've used his MFD magnetic field design technology on them that gives you a higher output per wind. And it's just, it, it gave us enough muscle to let these work in series, but also parallel. Parallel, parallel means that you could treat each one of these as a separate pickup, as I said. And each one has a positive and a negative, you know, it's got two leads. So let's say this has two leads and this has two leads. Parallel is like there's two terrain tracks and they just come together, right? That's parallel. Series is I'm going through one coil out from that and then I'm going to go into this coil through that and then out from there, right? I'm going through this door then I'm going to go through this into the other one and then out. That's series. Parallel is these two guys. They both come out together and then join in line. But parallel with these very weak pickups, it was just incredibly weak. It just didn't have much guts to it at all. So what we wanted to do, if possible, and there was no guarantees, we didn't know, we were exploring. Could we find a nice spot where within conjunction with the support of the preamp, we could use these little guys as either series or parallel and it works great. With parallel, you get this wonderful open airy jangle, but with still enough, just enough meat where it doesn't feel like it, it disappears in a mix. So our controls here is our pickup selector, neck middle bridge. Uh, this is the series or parallel. And when it's in series, it, uh, that means both pickups, each pickup operates in series, right? This goes through one, one coil and then the other coil and then out, right? And it's in parallel, so that, I guess you'd call this a global control for series and parallel. Now, uh, we have the preamp control. Uh, there is preamp off, so you can play this totally passive. It doesn't die. That's, uh, again, that was a, a concern. Whereas this guitar depends on the preamp for its, its sound. I mean, if the preamp were not there, it would have very little output. So we wanted these pickups to be able to sing on their own. And this is just an, a bonus. Because now with the preamp buffer on, any of the loading effect of the, the cable, you know, we get rid of that. So we ticked that other box. Leo loved that idea. And uh, we had a nice preamp board that has a treble boost, which is a little extra cool for funk. And especially if, you, if you're doing something that's dark and you want to brighten it up a little bit, because these pickups do have enough meat on them, there's cases where it's like, hey, I like that bottom end. I like that robustness, but I, would, I wish I had some more spark available. You could kick this into the third position, which is uh, with the kind of a high-end EQ boost, uh, which you can also do as a kind of a funk effect by kicking this guy up and having the, this preamp board do a little high-end EQ boost and roll back the treble to kind of rein it in a little bit. That's a pretty cool thing. Johnny Gomez, if you're out there, you know what I'm talking about. We have volume, treble, and bass. These are uh, really passive, the preamp, just happens afterwards. So uh, even with the preamp off, all this stuff works normally. The bass control is cool because like I said, these do get, they have the capability of getting thick, but if you really want to lean them out or if you've got a fuzz pedal, something where, you know, it, it gets muddy, you can lean things out with this, with the bass roll off. But lastly, on the back, we did not use six AA batteries because Everybody has nine volt batteries. But what we did do is we used the classic CLF research battery plate. Same thing we used in the 70s and 80s, stamped with battery, I love that. It's retro touch, it's just a battery plate, but oh, I love that stuff. This is just a working mule, so you can probably see there's like router bit uh, fuzz on this. It, it wasn't sanded at all. This is just something that we use to try to put the parts together and do a lot of pickup testing. So this thing's been kind of kicked around a bit. It's a special thing because this is the first time 
we saw that old draw, dusty drawing from 1969. It's the first time we saw it come to life. And it was real. And, it, and we put Leo's later technologies on it just like he would. And the way I like this is uh, letting musicians have more control. Leo was a big fan of that, but oftentimes sales departments and uh, salespeople were often thought players are too resistant to that. They don't want too much change. They don't want too many controls, it confuses them. But, the, you know, there was a lot of whiz bang stuff out that, that, you know, even Leo knew was he was a bit guilty of. You know, maybe it wasn't so substantive. But as the years came, went by, he became more interested in fundamental control, where if I have a pair of pickups here, can I let you have them in series and parallel? Can I do that? In our case, yeah, we tuned it, so we made it work. So we think he'd be proud of that. Uh, in, but if he had come back with this in the mid 1980s, he would have got some pushback probably about the switches, but I think people are much more open-minded now. And the kind of wonderful textures that you can do with this guitar, it's a new tool. In the late 60s, it wasn't quite ready, but it is now. And we call it the Espada. The reason we, well, we call it the Espada is because of this shape that we gave here. It's kind of like a sword here, and it comes up here. And this guitar can cut through any mix, that's for sure. Anyway, that's uh, about all I have to say about the Espada, uh, except uh, this uh, one just has our regular tuners. The production one's a bit different. It has Clusens on it for a retro vibe. I really wanted the guitar to look sort of period, like we, we as though we teleported it back to 1969 and we brought with it technology from the future, from Leo's own future, and installed it in 1969. And if that was the case, and it would have been the top end model, uh, that, that's why we had, you know, Clusens on there and uh, the block inlays on the, uh, the production ones because they look hot. And it just looks, it would have been the range topper, so hey, we've made, we wanted to make it look like it. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to click the like button and subscribe to see more videos like this one. Hope to see you next time. Thanks.